This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at the BatmanUniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. In 2008, a podcast was created with one goal. To bring Bat fans around the world news related to movies, comics, video games, television, merchandise, and so much more. And now, the Batman Universe Podcast has returned. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of the TBU Podcast. I'm Dustin Ottel, and BJ are here with me today, and we have a little bit of a gun watch, and we have a topic that's been sitting on our things to talk about for a little bit of time. It's, it's specifically talking about, um, there's an article, it's, it comes from a weird place, but it was an interesting read. Um, occasionally, I'll get some articles that'll get sent over to me from casino websites or gambling websites or uh, there's even some like just retailers in general where they spend some time putting together some graphics talking about the best or you know the best of something or they talk about uh, the most popular character or the pop- most popular movie or you know things like that and there was one that came across that got sent over to us um, that was specifically talking about the most successful film franchises of all time. And Batman is on there. So we were going to talk about that, but we're going to start off with gun watch because while we have had uh, two weeks since our last episode and it has been the holiday season, there has not been as much news as you would anticipate, but there of course has been some news. So I wanted to talk about um, some of the updates um, unofficial and official things that have come out since then, because this is like a ongoing timeline of events of what, you know, it's almost like a, uh, you know, the, the annals of history are going to be recorded amongst our timeline that we keep talking about when we do gun watch from every episode to every episode. So, um, that said, the first thing we've got is there was two things that posted like within days of each other, both related to Zachary Levi and his role or his, I should say, his security when it comes to playing Shazam in the future after this next film releases. So the first thing that he said was he said, uh, I really want to, somebody said specifically, I, I, I want this not to be true because his Shazam is one thing that in the DCU I would absolutely throw hands for per- to protect Zachary Levi's perfection. And specifically, they're talking about how they wouldn't want Zachary Levi to be recast or Shazam not to be featured in the future of whatever James Gunn and Peter Safran are putting together. And Zachary Levi responded, Ooh, I really wouldn't go believing everything you see on the internet. I'm Gucci Ash. We all Gucci. So he's basically saying that he's secure where he's at. And then a couple days later, he had an Instagram live where he specifically said, you have no idea the, any, you have no idea the reasons behind any of the discussions that are going on, the amount of conjecture and rumor mill and drama and nonsense that keeps getting spun about out there on Instagram and Twitter is laughable. It's unbelievably laughable. So I would say to be patient and give them some space and some time to try and really make something special. And I think something that DC deserves to have and something that Zack Snyder tried to do and it just didn't ultimately materialize, guys. Um, they're not just making decisions they like based off of what they like or what they don't like. They're making decisions based on what's best for Warner Brothers, DC, and the entire studio and entity and trying to make many fans as much of an audience happy as they can. Um, and then he said, listen, I have no idea what ultimately is going to happen to me. I think I'm in a pretty good position. I think we made a great movie. I think it's going to do well, reasonably well. I hope so. But again, regardless of that, if they decide at some point that this is the way we got to go, them's the breaks. That's how it goes. No. So specifically, it, this is all happening, you know, days after The Rock, Dwayne Johnson announced that, you know, there's no future plans for Black Adam. And um, while we're going to be talking about Dwayne Johnson in an article here in a little bit, 
Zachary Levi is in a completely different situation because one, he's not the mega star that Dwayne Johnson is. He doesn't need to have a film that is as successful. And I'm not saying it, it can't be successful. I'm saying that in the terms of success, Shazam was made for, you know, around a hundred million dollars or 120 or something like that. And it made 300, 400 million dollars worldwide. So it was, it was definitely profitable. Compare that to what happened with Black Adam, where the budget ballooned to like over 200 million dollars. And then it only ended up making under 400 million dollars worldwide. You have a problem there. There's a problem. You have a megastar like The Rock who is supposed to promote projects in a way that is supposed to be not heard of by a lot of or compared to a lot of other big stars. And then it just didn't deliver um, in terms of box office returns, regardless of the reasoning. It doesn't necessarily have to do with whether or not the marketing was there or whether or not the film wasn't great or it didn't have the buzz or the fan backing or anything like that. It just that's how it turned out. Shazam is in a different situation because they went into those movies making them on a smaller budget so that they could be more profitable because they didn't need to have them be insanely expensive. So personally, I think Shazam out of Black Adam Shazam, Shazam probably is in a better spot. But that's not to say that after the second film, there will be a immediate need or desire to have a third film in the future. Yeah, I think I do... Real quickly, I think we need to isolate you saying we Gucci, and we, we can always use that as a, a nah, little yeah. drop if we all agree. If we all agree on something, yeah. I think that'll be a big hit. That'll get us on TikTok. Uh, we'll be trending soon. But the Shazam movie, I really like the first one, and he's and he's great in the role. And um, like you said, that I think those movies they don't need to break the bank and make over make like Avengers Endgame money or anything like that. I think they're just good movies. They make them for cheap and. I was pretty successful, like considering the budget and everything like that. So yeah, you would think, well, they have the second one coming up, and you would think if they ever do do a third one, it would be Shazam vs. Black Adam. But uh, I don't think that was, was ever in the uh, pipeline, uh, ever on any plans ever. Yeah, I think uh, I mean um, the movie Shazam was not for me, but I, I do think that it was it was good, like it was well received. Um, Zachary Levi is good in the role. Um, and it's it's one of those projects, as you both have said, that you know there's a very um, low budget, and then there's a decent payoff, and so the movie is profitable, and it's one that DC should keep in their stable because honestly, not every movie is going to be like a blockbuster or you know some you know high art or whatever, but you need to have um, plenty of sort of mid range movies, uh, for lack of a better term, and I think. Shazam is one of them. Um, and I think the problem is, uh, I, we're going to talk about this later, uh, I think, but uh, The Rock wanted Black Adam to be a lot more than what he actually is. It would have been fine if Black Adam was just a character who appears in the Shazam movies, but uh, I think uh, The Rock wanted it to be sort of like a, a focal point of the DC universe. And they pumped a lot of uh, money into that film and they just didn't see the return that they need to, to keep it going. You know, what's funny to me is that when I look back on the history of black Adam, he has always been obviously very closely associated with Shazam. I never knew anything about black Adam except through Shazam. And when you know, when, when you go through the history of how long Dwayne Johnson has been involved with Warner brothers slash the potential of being, Black Adam or doing a project like Black Adam, it goes back pretty far. And then when you start to look at like the comic history of Black Adam over the last decade leading up to the release of Black Adam, the film, you can see that in some ways, someone within the corporate structure was really trying to push to create Black Adam to be a more prominent character. There was occasions where Black Adam had his own miniseries. He had a very prominent role in a couple of different uh crossovers that were happening or company-wide events uh the villain i don't remember which one it was but there was a villain event that happened at one point during the new 52 where black adam was like front and center for that um he w ended up becoming much more of an anti-hero towards the end of the new 52 and ended up becoming actually a member of the justice league at one point and when you look at that and you think to yourself okay 
why was this character who's who's never been associated as an anti-hero in in the same way that they're portraying him now why is this character doing this and the only thing i could think of is somebody from up above was saying hey we need to kind of like make this work because we've got this like super mega star who really wants to play this character but he can't be a villain and he can't be or he can't be a straight villain and it needs to work for the future and they were trying to basically rewrite history by creating these different Shazam stories that would make him less of a murderous villain and more of a anti-hero with murderous tendencies, Tendencies, I guess. But Yeah, if you um, – in Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths, like that miniseries that just ended, at one point Black Adam gives his power – like to all the superheroes and it's just funny how like the timing of a couple weeks after the movie yep. black adam was this major player and like a big crisis event for dc so it's yeah. funny you say that I, I i read this uh it's probably pure rumor um but does the rock have a clause in his contract where he can't lose or something i I've mean that too with um the fast and furious movies like him and vin diesel like the yeah, if, uh, my understanding from what I heard regarding the Fast and the Furious stuff was that if they're ever in a fight, there cannot be a decisive winner if it's not The Rock. And, I, and I'm, I'm thinking the only reason why that ever actually got leaked or anybody ever found out about that was because of the friction that happened between Vin Diesel and The Rock. And they, you know, they had some heat online that uh, was very public for a while. And th- that's my thought process on that. But I, I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, the thing is, consistently, The Rock delivers when it comes to projects. He, he's starting to like level out to the point where like he's not necessarily just the only thing that's going to sell a project. I mean, when you look at projects going back, like a, a project like Jumanji, who would have ever thought that a reboot of Jumanji was going to do as well as it did for Sony? And a lot of that could be attributed to the fact that The Rock was in it. But The Rock's been in other projects where it doesn't do, like, insane numbers. It does well, and it's successful, but it's not, like, amazing. The problem is, in just the past, like, I want to say, like, five years, honestly, since that Jumanji, his roles have really ballooned to the point where, like, he is the main attraction for each one of these films. You know, he got the spinoff from Fast and the Furious with Hobbs and Shaw. He had... Um, well, obviously a sequel to Jumanji, and there's, I believe, another sequel down the line that's coming. Um, he, he's had other projects where he's no longer, you know, a character that can pop up in a, in a simple project. He went from being like the typical Hollywood actor who was able to be in a show like Ballers on HBO where he's doing good work to he can't do the show anymore because he's making too much money doing these other projects that he's doing with the movies and making as much money as it, as he is. So like it's not that I, I think the problem is that he his career is like leveling out. He's, he's no longer like straight up towards the peak of the mountain. He's peaked off and he's just at that level and Black Adam is a perfect example of it. He's obviously had some other films in the last 10 years that have not done as well. Um, Hercules is the one that comes to mind, and I know that it hasn't been 10 years, but there has been projects that it just doesn't always work out. But Black Adam was not supposed to be one of those. And we're going to talk a little bit more about him in a little bit, so I want to save that because there's some other things in the an article that popped up that uh, were kind of amusing. Um, next information comes specifically from James Gunn. Specifically, somebody asked him, are you open to producing any Elseworld, Elseworlds DC projects that aren't set in the DCU? And he specifically said that is actively happening. Uh, remember, we said that uh, James Gunn is very active on Twitter in response to a lot of questions. Um, he wasn't doing as much during the holiday season, but he did do some. And what was interesting about this specific remark is, in some ways, we can already kind of assume that that's happening. We've got the Joker project, which the first film was obviously very successful. They're making a sequel that's coming in 2024. They've got the Batman stuff, which is not intended to be attached to whatever they're doing with the other portion of the DC universe. He's already gone on record to say that the Matt Reeves stuff is its own thing. Um, So it's not to say that there isn't projects. Those are already two very distinct projects that are occurring, but there's that's not to say that other things can't happen as well. It would be cool to see some things where it's like outside of continuity. Like 
I the the one of them that immediately comes to mind because there's an animated adaptation of it is like stuff like uh, Justice League New Frontier. You can you can do that as like a standalone story, but you can't really do that as a part of a larger story, part of a larger series of films. It's just not likely to happen because of the source material that it's based off of. There's other projects that you could do that are like really off the wall, you know, stuff like. But they've done a lot of them have been adapted into animation for film. Um, so I don't know that they're necessarily going to go that route, but let's just stick with the, the, you know, the few years that James Gunn actually has before we start getting too crazy out there with like the different projects that may or may not happen down the line after he initially gets the foundation of this going. Yeah. Elseworlds. I mean, like you said, uh, they can always just say Batman and Joker are quote unquote Elseworlds. And I do wonder, I think we talked about this on a previous podcast, but I do wonder if they are going to use the animation side of things to be their Elseworlds, like release on um, Blu-ray or whatever, or put on an HBO Max thing like that, in a, uh, more of an animated form. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Um, I don't think everything has to always be connected. You know, obviously there's positives to uh, having a connected universe. Marvel is a great example. I mean, Star Wars is another one. It's even more connected than Marvel because they incorporate, you know, books and games and comics and that sort of thing as well. Um, DC Animated has already done some. I think there is one uh, that's going to be coming out. I think it's like, I forget the name of it, but it's like Batman set in the like 1920s or something, um, which I'm looking forward to. Um, I also think, you know, in live action, they could do things, you know, in the future. Like, there's always been talk about a Batman Beyond film. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be with Michael Keaton. Um, it could just be with anyone, and that could maybe start its own sort of, like, futuristic DC thing. Um, but I think, you know, even if it's just, uh, even if it's just, like, you know, individual franchises, like Matt Reeves' Batman universe is, is its own thing, and then you have, um, Whoever I think it's Todd Phillips who did Joker has his uh, has his own sort of universe there, and and these individual franchises are building and just producing good movies. I think it's a good thing overall. All right, and then the official announcement from The Rock. Um, this was back on December twentieth. Now, like I said, a lot of this stuff is kind of blending together around the same time frame. Um, that initial report of Zachary Levi potentially not coming back or fans questioning whether he would come back was specifically because of this specific thing that the rock posted Um, on December 20th. He posted this response "My passionate friends. I want to give you a long awaited black Adam update regarding the character's future in the new DC universe. James Gunn and I connected and black Adam will not be part of their first chapter of storytelling. However, DC and seven bucks have agreed to continue exploring the most valuable ways Black Adam can be utilized in future DC multiverse chapters. James and I have known each other for years and have always rooted for each other to succeed. It's no different now, and I will always root for DC and Marvel to win and win big. You guys know me, and I have very thick skin, and you can always count on me to be direct with my words. These decisions made by James and DC leadership represent their vision of the DCU through their creative lens after 15 years of relentless hard work to finally make black adam i'm very proud of the film we delivered for fans worldwide i will always look back on the fan reaction to black adam with tremendous gratitude humility and love we did great to my very passionate and vocal black adam slash superhero genre fans i love you thank you and i will always listen to you and do my best to deliver and entertain you what a hell of a month now we have now we all need some you know his of his tequila is you know of course his uh name drop of his tequila which i'm not going to pronounce because i'm going to butcher it i think it's termana uh have a productive week and happy holidays to you and your families dj and then james gunn responded and said love the rock and i and i am always excited to see what he and seven bucks do next can't wait to collaborate soon so this is like, you know, nailing the coffin. Black Adam is not coming back anytime in the near future, if if potentially ever. Um, there, there might not be a situation where they need Black Adam to come back. Um, this film, in a lot of ways, was a way for it to either work or not work. It's such a strange character. We've talked about this before, but Black Adam is such a strange character to try to make your own, to like become something bigger than he really is. This character was, you know, at, at best... 
the villain of a C-list hero. And I'm, I'm not trying to crap on Shazam, but let's be honest, Shazam is not a huge hero. And Black Adam is a villain that is closely associated with a C-list character. So essentially, you're saying that it's a D-list character, and he tried to make it into a character. You know, I'll never forget when they first, the it was DC Fandom and Dwayne Johnson shows up and he's like, the hierarchy of the DC universe is about to change. And I immediately saw that and I, I kind of like chuckled to myself because I kept thinking to myself, why would it change? What's going to change? This is not a character that anybody's like vying for. Nobody's asking for this character. Like I understand that this was a passion project for you know, Dwayne Johnson, this was something that he really wanted to do because he believes this character is, you know, believes, earn needs more attention or deserves more attention, you know, can stand toe to toe with Superman. But in the larger scheme of things, I just don't see how he would, he thought that this character, like without like just completely hitting it out of the park, like Guardians of the Galaxy did, where it was a bunch of no-name characters, and you completely turned it into like a huge, you know, franchise within a franchise because of it just being so successful. I don't, and, and that's not even a film that everybody enjoys. There's lots of people who don't like Guardians of the Galaxy. So like for Black Adam, I don't know how he was seeing this happen unless it, it just was like an amazing film that everybody enjoyed. I do wonder if um, The Rock has ever actually, I don't know if he's ever said it, but has he ever actually read anything with Black Adam in it? I feel like he saw like a, a like a comic book panel online or someone drew a mock-up of him as Black Adam. was like, ah, man, that's badass. I think I am going to do that. Yeah. And then he spent 15 years like building it up to where, like I, we both talked about the movie we liked. It was a popcorn movie. It was an action movie, but it didn't um, really... Want, we weren't really dying for a sequel or anything. I think we knew we were excited about the Superman prospect, but in the back of our minds, we were always like, "Hey, isn't this? He's Shazam's uh, villain here. Like, this is that's his Joker. Like, why why is he going after Superman? Stuff like that." So it is always strange how uh, it was all built up. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, I, I'm gonna actually save my take for the uh, when we discuss the Variety article that you shared today because it's connected to that. So I'll just wait. All right. So then next up, this is just a quick update. There was a, you know, there's a Green Lantern uh, project that supposedly was, has been in the works for quite some time. Um, it was a, supposed to be a series. It was announced ages ago for HBO Max. And there was a report that came out saying that uh, based off of what James Gunn has planned for G- Green Lantern, they're scrapping the series and it's not happening. And he basically came out right away on Twitter and said, "Nope, that's fake. Uh, that's not true." So that's not to say that the series that he doesn't have plans for Green Lantern or that they're not or are tied into you know a the the series that they're working on. But the point is. The, the people are just going to keep making reports. They're just going to keep releasing stuff. And everything that they release is not necessarily true because I think that there are certain sites out there that are going to throw things at the wall and they're going to get as many clicks as they possibly can for in a very short amount of time before someone calls them out for being full of crap. And they're just, you know, r- r- rolling in that ad revenue for the amount of clicks that they're getting. Which brings me to my next point, which was... Randomly, I was scrolling through TikTok one night, and I, I came across this TikTok, and I'm going to play it for you. Um, I apologize to my co-hosts because I don't think they're going to be able to hear it, but uh, you, the listeners, should be able to hear it. So this is what the report was. Reported that Ben Affleck, Gal Gadot, and Henry Cavill met over Zoom to discuss suing Warner. I'm not going to go into the the reaction that this was, but basically, if you were unable to hear it, there was a report that came out that Henry Cavill, Ben Affleck, and Gal Gadot all got together, met on Zoom, and decided they're going to sue Warner Brothers because. They're they're pissed about the fact that James Gunn and everybody in charge is uprooting the DC universe and none of them are involved. Uh, there's a couple problems with that. One, um, Gal Gadot has p- remained pretty quiet about whatever is happening with Wonder Woman. Henry Cavill has already said he's no longer being Superman and understands what's happening. They've also gone on record to say that him and James Gunn have plans of him being involved in the future for something, regardless of what it is. And we've also heard that Ben Affleck is potentially interested in directing stuff, just not wanting to be behind, you know, in front of the camera as Batman for any projects. So 
we've already heard these things, so why all of a sudden would the three actors decide they could go sue Warner Brothers? Now, the other side of this is that further on in the TikTok, the uh, the the girl who posts it, uh, her name is you or your TV girl. Um, she said that Warner Brothers is in hot water because these three actors have a huge they have cause to go after Warner Brothers because of this. And I'm not trying to crap on anybody in this, but the way media works, when you have a contract to appear in films, it's an option. There's an option to have you appear in films. Just like if you're in a TV show, there's an option in your contract for a second season or for multiple seasons down the line. Or initially you could have an order for, you could have in your contract that you're, you know, you're signed for multiple seasons up front. Typically, the way it works is is if the show gets canceled or they don't end up greenlighting the future films, it just there's nothing that happens. Your initial contract includes a clause that says that you're getting paid X amount of money for the first one, and then if you have clauses that include you know appearances in future films, you're getting paid for those regardless of whether or not you're actually going to do them. Um, that's part of your contract. Now, there's bonuses that you get for appearing in those other films. Or there could be residuals and things like that that you get for appearing in whatever project it is. But you cannot go after the studio for saying, we don't need you in a film. That's not how that works. Nobody does that. Uh, the only time anybody, any actor goes after a studio is if the studio didn't pay them what they were owed. Um, or they had a problem with something like we saw during COVID when Black Widow got released and then um, Scarlett Johansson went after Disney for not getting paid because the film was released, uh, I think it was released exclusively on Disney Plus and it wasn't intended to be, which means Scarlett Johansson, which was the main star of the film, she lost out on money that didn't get paid. That was the same thing that happened when Wonder Woman 1984 released and that film released and when that did, they went to... Um, the director and Gal Gadot, and they said, here, we're going to pay you so much money because it's not going to come out in theaters. We're going to give you this. And they had to go rene renegotiate all those other Warner Brothers films that were coming out in 2021 exclusively on HBO Max instead of in theaters was for that exact same purpose. They were they had to renegotiate all those contracts in place. And it was, you know, honestly, a giant cluster. There was a big problem with having that work out and I'm sure that there was, and we know from the fallout of everything that a lot of people were not happy about it, about the the need to have this stuff on HBO Max exclusively instead of foregoing and keeping films out of you know off of streaming and just holding on to them until after the pandemic was over. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. I mean, there's certain Marvel films that released and they did fine. They didn't do as well as you know previous Marvel films, and then you have films like Top Gun Maverick, which was held back on purpose for two years um, and released and ended up doing amazingly well. So like it, it could go either way, and then a lot of it has to do with the content of the film. That said, this report is ridiculous. I'm just including it because I just thought it was absolutely you know ridiculous that th this was even a thing. I tried to see if I could find the actual report that this came from. I could not find anything. So I'm guessing, like I said before, this is just one of those random things that somebody throws out into the ether, hoping that it's going to get picked up and uh, they'll get some clicks. I like the idea of um, Cavill, uh, Godot, and uh, Affleck on a Zoom meeting uh, <laughs> together. It makes I think of uh, that scene in um, Batman v Superman where they're finally all together and that score is just blaring in the background. That's my that's what I picture them talking about on the zoom meeting the music just plays while yeah. they talk so <laughs> yeah all right and then the last bit of update we have is actually comes today uh we're recording this on january 4th and this report came out from variety uh the article title is secret meetings tequila and black adam vs superman how dwayne johnson's bid for dc power flamed out and boy oh boy um, everything we've been talking about when it comes to Dwayne Johnson and how his entire, like, basically the, uh, the coup that he was trying to do at, you know, within DC, this, this lays it out perfectly. Um, he basically, the article basically goes on to say that he originally went around everybody, all the executives that would typically, he would typically talk to and went straight to the CEO when Warner Brothers, uh, and Discovery merged back in April he pitched to David Zaslav a massive Batman Superman 
you know, thing where multiple films would lead up to them facing off against each other. Essentially, the idea of like, you know, Batman v Superman, but with Batman or Black Adam v Superman down the line, but other films leading up to it, Black Adam being the first in that series. At the time, he, you know, he pitched this and it really wasn't like super well taken. A lot of the executives were kind of pissed that they went, the, that he went around them and went right over them to David Zaslov. Um, it, and it turns out that uh, Henry Cavill getting the cameo in Black Adam was almost as if they were using it as a test to see if it would actually grow into something, if it would be worth it. And they did. They agreed agree to it because they were like, let's see if this is actually going to materialize into something. When it didn't, obviously there's problems. Um, there was, but there's a couple of other things in here that I just thought were interesting. So we didn't talk about this. At some point, we're going to get back to it. But DC League of Super Pets was an animated film that Warner Brothers Animation put out in theaters earlier this summer. I, I, I believe it came out back in July. It was originally scheduled. For a while back during the pandemic, I think it was last year, and then they pushed it to this year, um, and it was it released in July. It released very under the radar in the sense of like there was some marketing, but not a ton of marketing, and there was it did fine. Like I don't I don't remember exactly how much it did. I'll pull it up while we're talking about this. But the thing is, the film was fine. Well, in that film. Crypto the Superdog, which was the main star, was voiced by Dwayne Johnson. So you would think that Dwayne Johnson would have been doing a lot of marketing. Well, supposedly, Warner Brothers was kind of ticked about how little amount of marketing he actually took place in because he insisted on a producer credit for that film, but then didn't actually partake in a lot of marketing for the film. And they were kind of ticked about that. Um, and then they were obviously ticked about him going around their backs. But then it turns out at the Black Adam premiere... He insisted that his tequila brand have its own stand, even though the film is rated PG-13 and most of the people who could be attending weren't necessarily 21. Um, so there's that. So there's a lot of problems here, but it shows that there was some uh, there was an obvious divide between what was happening and what Dwayne Johnson wanted to happen. Um, and it cements what we've, what we've talked about earlier and uh, in past episodes where it really does seem like he was attempting to to do something that that cemented him within the DC universe, but didn't necessarily take into account everything else that was happening around him. And just as a heads up, the film was done with a ninety million dollar budget, uh, DC League of Super Pets, and the box office was two hundred and five. So, not great numbers for that film either. Yeah, I think it's it's clear. Uh, it's been clear for a while, and I said this before. You know, and I don't want it to come off like I'm I'm hating The Rock or whatever, but. I think the reality is he's, as I said, he's not an actor. He's an entertainer slash businessman. And I think for him, he, this playing Black Adam wasn't really more about the role. It was about him using the character as a vehicle to secure his piece of the pie in Warner Brothers or in, with the DC Universe. Um, and it's kind of interesting because in the article, you, you find out just how how deep the connections go. And this is kind of Hollywood in general as well, right? Like the, one of the producers for Black Adam was his former brother-in-law. And then Henry Cavill's agent or his manager was The Rock's ex-wife. Who um, also happens to be The Rock's agent as well. Right. And so <laughs> it becomes very clear that, you know, this is this was him just, you know, and then there's a report of him going behind people's backs. So this was him using the character as a vehicle to uh, obtain a piece of the pie in a power vacuum. Um, so this was like a corporate power play more than anything else. It wasn't as much as he promotes it, I think, as him loving the character or whatever. I think that's what it is in, in reality. Yeah, I guess we're definitely not going to get a, a, le a sequel to League of Super Pets, um, considering all this. I guess one thing I'm a little confused on is, like, what, what marketing did they expect The Rock to do? Like... It was a kid's movie. I don't think he's going to go on like late night talk shows and promote it. So I guess I'm a little confused on that. But I mean, everything else, like Otto said, like he was he's going around people's backs. He's hooking up uh, his ex-wife's talent, try to help get deals done that way. So it was very somewhat shady stuff by The Rock. 
Yeah, I think the type of marketing that they were looking for was the type of marketing that he did for like a film like Moana, which he didn't even have the you know the the top billing in that film, but that film went on to make you know was pretty successful, and he was a big part of the marketing. Um, and I know for I know that he probably did a talk talk show circuit run and things like that. Now. Uh, you know, there's this obvious divide, which is how much was Warner Brothers expecting him to do compared to how much was Warner Brothers looking to foot the bill for? Because Warner Brothers has a tendency when it comes to their animated films to not market the films in a lot, in a, in a very large way. And I say that because they've had a, a bunch of different films release uh, for a while. In some ways, I well, for a good stretch, there was like one uh, animated film released in theaters every single year for quite some time up until about COVID, and none of them do extremely well. I mean, like they, in a, I think the, in a lot of ways, the most profitable one was probably the Lego Movie, which was ages ago. Um, the Lego Batman movie and the Lego Movie Two, neither one of those did as as well as the Lego Movie. But they were doing like one animated film per year, and even when you look at the Lego Movie, like it did well, but it wasn't like a, a billion dollar thing. Most animations not. I mean, there's a, most of all of the Disney stuff that releases, like there's only a small fraction of them that actually ends up making a billion dollars. Um, you know, like Frozen made a billion dollars, and I'm sure there's a couple others, you know, more recently that have made a billion dollars, but I know Frozen made an insane amount of money, but not every single one of the films that they released do that because it's just not the same market. In that regard, I, I'm not sure when it comes to the DC League of Super Pets. I think it's interesting because The Rock has always been portrayed as this, you know, people's, you know, obviously when he was in wrestling, he was known as the people's champion. And, uh, you know, he was the the person who was, you know, looking out for the people and the people's representative in a lot of ways. And in the last couple of years, he's had a show um, on NBC that he produces and he's part of, and it's kind of like his life story played out as if he is running for president in the future and things like that. And there's always, there was talks before 2020 about will Dwayne Johnson run for president in the future? And it's like, Oh, well he's so popular. He probably could. And, and it's like, I don't know that he's that person. Um, I, I think that a lot of people assume that he's like this super likable guy because he's, that's what he is in a lot of his films. But I think behind the scenes, he is constantly in business for himself. And I'm not, I, I'm not trying to crap on The Rock. I, I've always actually liked The Rock. Um, when he was in... I, I used to watch wrestling uh, You know, when I was younger. And I liked him even when he turned heel. And he was not the good guy. I still liked him. Um, I... You know, when he went off to Hollywood and he made a bunch of films, some of them were good. Some of them were fine. But, like, you could see that, like, for a while, he was really trying to, like cement himself as just somebody who could do a lot of different things. He could do comedy. He could do family. He could do action. He could do a bunch of different types of roles in a variety of different projects. And it was good. And then all of a sudden he just blew up. And it honestly, a lot of it I think had to do with his, his role in fast and the furious and how those films always end up doing extremely well when it comes to the box office return. He becomes a more global star when it comes to the projects he's working on. And, you know, regardless of whether or not he was involved with DC and Warner brothers before he became super huge, it doesn't matter. The point is it's a very strange situation to go from, you know, he is all about promoting something to, he doesn't want to have anything to do with it. I mean, Black Adam just premiered on HBO Max. You didn't see or hear really any promotion for it. I mean, I saw a couple of ads online, but it had nothing to do with him. I don't really remember hearing a lot of you know him talking about Black Adam uh, on the, the late night circuit or anything like that, other than that little blurb that came out about him saying, oh yeah, Superman's coming back, which in some ways you could, after the fact, you can see... Superman wasn't in the film. Superman was an afterthought that was added into the film, which means the reason he revealed it was because he legitimately was concerned on whether or not that film was going to make money and people were actually going to turn out to see it. So he announced it ahead of time to make sure that people actually went. That would be the equivalent of like, 
then uh, Robert Downey Jr. going out and saying that at the end of Iron Man, Nick Fury shows up to talk about the Avengers. And he tells that like a week before the film comes out in theaters. That <laughs> you don't do that. You you let the grassroots people you let people talk about it and it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and that's what happens. And you could tell that from that specific situation, he knew there was going to be a problem. And overall, it's just amusing because I think that overall, people have a desire to see things from the perspective of everybody, the people that they want involved are going to be involved. When you look at all of the, the, the fans who want Zack Snyder to come back or Zack Snyder's universe to be intact, they're going to be, they're, they're always going to want that. And the same thing's going to be said about Dwayne Johnson. I'm not trying to compare the two. I'm, they're, just, they're completely different situations. But in a lot of ways, Dwayne Johnson doing what he's doing is coming across very much like Zack Snyder when he was upset about Joss Whedon's cut coming out. Um, you know, the DC Universe kind of fell apart. And in a lot of ways, if the DC Universe and the other f- films that were supposed to release released when they were, maybe Black Adam would have got a little bit of a rub from DC releasing a lot of really good movies. But everything got adjusted and everything got moved. And somehow Black Adam ended up as the one film that was releasing this this year outside of Batman, which had nothing to do with the overall DC Universe. So, you know, it's it sucks because I'm sure, you know, legitimately if The Rock is like super thrilled with this character, believes that this character is the best DC character in the world, you know, it sucks for him. But at the same time, a lot of the things that you hear about and a lot of things that we've seen him do come across as he had a very specific goal and it was to make a character that he wanted to be big, big. One of my favorite things, like to go back of uh, the Rock being the people's champion and a people pleaser, is in that big statement he put out was when he uh, said, "Like I, I always support DC," and then parentheses and Marvel, like almost leaving a little old door open, like I might maybe I'll go to Marvel or yeah. Marvel. I'm over here. I'm available. Yeah. So, so like that's been like my joke. Like oh, I was gonna go heal and go go to Marvel. Yep. All right, so that is the end of Gunwatch. No other news from Gunwatch. I'm sure, we'll, like I said, we'll have more when we have our next episode because more stuff keeps popping up. But the last thing we want to talk about is our discussion, which is um, it comes from Betway Insider, and it's on their blog. And the title of the article is Revealed, the Most Successful Film Franchises of All Time. Now, normally I don't pay a lot of attention to these, but they do a good job of incorporating a lot of different franchises, number one. And number two, they had the the way they were ranking them was very interesting. So there was a bunch of different things that they ranked out of. There was nine uh, different categories that they ranked it out of. This is what they were. Box office taking score, average IMDb rating score, number of awards won score, number returning cast member score, total movie title search score, wiki fandom score, merchandise search score, release date search score, trailer searches score. And on this list, it's out of 90 points, Batman comes in at 61.5. And to put that in perspective, that's fifth place behind Star Wars, Spider-Man, Marvel, and Harry Potter. Now, more specifically, when you com- when you look at the numbers, the the highest score, the ten, is going to be the ones that are the, the best at. And Batman scores ten only in one category, which is release date search score. Now, I, I'm not trying in any way, shape, or form to say this is a definitive graph, and we should definitely go off of this. And I'm not trying to say that Batman is more popular than Star Wars, Spider Man, Marvel, or Harry Potter. That's it's always going to change based off of you know what type of format you're using to judge these things. I will say that Spider-Man notoriously has always sold better and more merchandise than Batman. I know that from my past uh, research when it comes to merchandise. Um, Overall, Marvel does, like, if you collectively use every single character that they sell, not including Spider-Man, they probably have, they probably do pass Batman now just because there hasn't been a Batman film since 2016 and now we just had this Batman film now but there has there was a big gap and there wasn't a lot of animated stuff or other things that you could actually classify yeah there's a need for or a desire for a lot of merchandise to be out there it was just the last couple of years that McFarlane started making action figures and there was a consistent amount of Batman action figures in stores um 
So, but it was interesting because the only one that he scored, the only one that Batman scored a perfect 10 out of was release day search score. And I'm guessing that means uh, my translation of that one would be when the film comes out, people are searching for when the next film comes out. Um, which at the moment, it would seem knowing that there's going to be a sequel to the Batman, people would be searching for that more so now compared to, you know, two years, two years ago or three years ago or before the Batman was announced in the first place. Um, when you compare it to the Star Wars, there is no Star Wars you know, film that is potentially coming out immediately. They don't have anything set on a schedule at the moment. Same thing with Spider-Man. There's sequels and things coming, but it's odd. And then you compare it to Marvel, which is a 2.1, which doesn't make any sense. But I thought it was an interesting thing because I wanted to get your guys' perspective. Do you think that Batman belongs right where he's at or do you think it should belong higher based off of your own thoughts of where batman as a franchise stands um for me it kind of makes it kind of makes sense i figured i guess i would put thought he would be above harry potter but definitely star wars uh it totally makes perfect sense as star wars is number one they're a juggernaut with things like that and the marvel one yeah they do have two two of them that are kind of strange the trailer searches and the release date searches but other than that i think it kind of this whole like this whole list kind of makes kind of perfect sense really it has all the big franchises and i think they're all in a correct spot there's nothing really that jumps out at me that is kind of jarring or anything yeah i think um the only thing that i would have expected to be above batman is james bond just because i think there have been so many more films over the years but, I mean, I think all the categories on this list are interesting and, and a good way to sort of uh, aggregate or find the average score for all these films. But I, I'm just, I don't know how they're calculating the scores themselves. Like, so, for example, as you said, Marvel has 2.1 on release date score. Like, how do you, how do they come up with that 2.1 is what I'm wondering. Yeah, I don't know. And some of them are weird because it seems like they're going off of, like, search scores. Like, they did a Google search term for certain things and then that's where they're getting the rating which one rates highest you know if they type in marvel or marvel movie franchise will it pop up higher than batman movie franchise and if that's the case that seems like such a strange thing to be judging something off of it's just the search scores for something on google or something like that i it's weird because when you look at some of these it's also interesting because you have to wonder which ones were they actually classifying as Batman. Uh, there's a section further down. The only other DC thing that pops up on this list is the DC Extended Universe, which is down much further down the list. But obviously, that's very specific to Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, Justice League, and then maybe some of the other films that they may or may not consider part of that franchise. But the thing is... That is not the DC universe or DC films because there's been a lot more DC films than just the extended universe that a lot of people classify as the Snyderverse. Um, so there's that. So that's a weird one because that's the only other DC one. There's no Superman on the list. They randomly have Barbershop on the list. Yeah, that, that was weird. <laughs> and I'm like, Barbershop, really? Um, another odd one that was on here. So like they have... Spider-Man, Marvel, X-Men, which all of those make sense to be separate because for the longest time, Spider-Man was associated with Sony. Uh, Marvel is obviously Marvel. And then you've got X-Men, which were associated with 20th Century Fox up until the deal went through with 20th Century Fox and Disney. So all that said, like it makes sense that those three are separate, but are they classifying the Marvel section as just the Marvel franchise, like the MCU section, because if so, why wouldn't they have just titled it MCU? So, like, there's that. Um, some of these other ones, like, I don't really have a whole huge problem with some of them. Die Hard's kind of a weird one because there's only a couple, you know, there's there are multiple films, but I can't see them really doing anything for merchandise, and I don't know why they would even put them on here. I feel like there's other franchises that you could do. Like, I imagine Toy Story would be up there because they have multiple films and they sell merchandise and things like that. Um, it seems like a weird thing to not include yeah, some other no, franchise. Like, there's no, like, um, like those kid movies yeah. on here. It's all kind of more adult-themed movies. Yeah. I didn't think about that. So, 
it was just a quick thing that I saw that I wanted to bring up, but it wasn't time time sensitive, so that's why we waited until now. I'll have the article linked in the in the the description for the podcast if you guys want to check it out to see and compare some of the ratings. I I'm kind of curious. I, I'm going to look at some of these in the future um, and see if I can find some more because I've seen other ones like this comparing different different superheroes and their popularity. And it'll be interesting to compare some of these in the future. So that's something that I'm going to look into doing down the line. And if you guys are interested, let us know by leaving a comment below. With all that being said, that's going to wrap up this episode of the TBU podcast. Uh, we appreciate you guys uh, taking a listen. Uh, we hope you guys had a great holiday season. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about movies, television, video games, comics, merchandise, and everything else related to the Bat fandom, be sure to check out our website, which has all kinds of news, editorials, reviews, other podcasts, all related to the Batman universe. Also, be for sure to follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Discord, YouTube. All of our social links can be found over at the website at the top of the page, thebatmanuniverse.net. You can send us an email at tbu at thebatmanuniverse.net. And if you're interested in supporting us, you, there's all kinds of different ways. Just head over to the website and look for the support section at the bottom of the page. With all of that being said, for BJ, Otto, and myself, thank you so much for listening to this episode, and we will see you guys next time.